Dr. Aaron Lorenz is an associate professor of soybean breeding and genetics in the Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics at the University of Minnesota. The University of Minnesota soybean breeding program develops specialty food type and general use soybean varieties adapted to the upper Midwest. Dr. Lorenz's research focuses on the optimization and, ap and application of genomics and phenomics to an applied cultivar development program. Additional areas of research include the mapping of genes underlying complex traits relevant to soybean production and the development of soybean varieties adapted to nutrient systems. Let's see here. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation to be here to give a presentation. It's uh, great to have the opportunity, and I've really enjoyed uh, the presentations and the discussion today uh, my colleagues to the, to the Northwest. So I'm just going to, my, my goal today is to sort of give an overview of the University of Minnesota Soybean Breeding Program. Um, I guess kind of give a snapshot uh, at a pretty high level of some of the things that we're doing. I'm going to avoid listing every single thing that we're doing uh, just for the sake of time. I don't want to make this less of a laundry list and go into a couple of details on some projects, but I'm going to keep this at a, at a pretty, pretty high level. Obviously, the first question is, well, who are we uh, in our program? And, you know, basically, we're, we're a group that is myself who leads the group. Uh, I have several technicians in the group, a few postdocs a few graduate students at any given time. And uh, we also have a lot of undergraduates in our program that come from, from all over the world, actually. There's a program here called the, the MASS program, and it's basically an agricultural, uh, international agricultural internship program. And so we get student workers from all over the world. So in any given, at any given time in our program, we have um, uh, people, at least a couple people from, from five continents in our program. So it's really been a, a rewarding experience working with all these people uh, throughout these last, uh, I've been here for about five or six years now. So in terms of what we do and, and why we're doing it, I've um, come up with a little bit of a mission statement for our program, and it's, it's quite simple. So our, our mission statement is basically to advance soybean cultivar development through research, education, and outreach. I was told by somebody that your mission statement should be simple enough, simple enough so that you can remember it at three o'clock in the morning. And so I had that in mind when I crafted this mission statement. I think it's the mission statement of a lot of our, a lot of our programs out there. But more specifically in our program, we try to advance breeding methods and techniques through the development, adoption, and optimization of, of uh, new technologies and discovery. Uh, we try to also, along the way, develop new cultivars. And we develop cultivars for specialty markets to increase the diversity of economic opportunity that farmers may have up in this region. You know, those niche markets, those markets that demand some sort of premium, we try to play a, a role in that. And, you know, in addition to that, as Carrie is talking about, we also um, develop conventional varieties that's for which farmers can save their seed. And, you know, not that many farmers are doing that these days, but nevertheless, uh, that's an important opportunity for some, for some farmers that may meet their specific situation. So, um, and then in addition to that, we work with a lot of researchers on campus who are in the area of plant pathology, or maybe genomics, or maybe entomology, and working with them to discover new sources of resistance, maybe new genes underlying some sort of special composition trait. And we work with them, and we try to get those genes in, into elite varieties, and so that someday they, they may have a chance at actually being in a farmer's field and impact in natural production. And then, and then we want to also uh, advance knowledge of the genetic architecture underlying uh, certain traits, especially those that are economically important. And, you know, least, last but certainly not least, I always sort of flows this way that the education part comes at the end. Uh, in any case, educating uh, future scientists to work in agriculture uh, generally and impact in agriculture is also a, a goal of ours. So that's kind of a, a level, a high level overview of what we do. A little bit of history about the program. The program goes back to the 1940s, um, back in the 1940s when soybean was sort of up and coming in this country. Uh, There's a little bit of pressure on the department head at the time, H.K. Uh, Hayes, to begin a soybean breeding program. H.K. Hayes, uh, who was a real force in the development of, of, of hybrid corn breeding back in those days, was a little bit reluctant to start soybean breeding here, start anything to do with soybeans for that matter. He thought that soybeans were going to always be a specialty crop, kind of a niche crop, and they would never really take off in a big way. But nevertheless, he relented and uh, began putting together a soybean breeding program. And he actually recruited the barley breeder at the time. The barley breeder at the time back in the 1940s was Gene Lambert. And he recruited him into starting a part-time soybean breeding program uh, conducted alongside his current uh, uh, barley breeding program. Back in those days, Minnesota was a pretty much the epicenter of uh, barley production, a lot of barley in the state. Of course, that's, most of that has moved out 
uh, further west. So that went on for a number of years. He released the first variety, Renville, that was bred in Minnesota um, in 1953. Up until this time, there were, there were introductions uh, that were basically purified here that were grown like soy soda and min soy and things like that, direct introductions from China. But Renville would have been the first variety that was actually bred through crossbreeding back in 1953. And then in 1961, Gene Lambert started to switch over to full-time soybean breeding. And that's when we hired uh, Don, Don Rasmussen as the full-time barley breeder back then. 1965, the second variety was released. And then fast forward to the early 1980s is when my predecessor, Jim Orff was hired. And then of course, starting in the 19, uh, 90s is when Roundup Brady soybeans were introduced, more and more privatization and investment from the private companies into soybean breeding and releasing those varieties. And that's when Jim, back in, in the 90s, started switching uh, some of the focus, at least, or a lot of the focus, at least, in, in the program to uh, food grade and specialty type, type soybeans. And then again, I started here about uh, six years ago now already. So a little snapshot of our history. Where we are now, uh, the way I look at our program is I look at it at uh, four interacting equal parts. So we have the applied variety development components of the program. Uh, but alongside that, we have uh, we research breeding methods, we research new traits, uh, new germplasm, as I talked about in my mission statement. And of course, we educate students. And we focus on yield, stress resistance, quality, especially in relation to specialty markets and early maturity for, for Minnesota. So let me just touch a little bit on variety development here. I can't go into any, any one of these products in much detail, but I'll just kind of talk a little bit about what we do. And then, you know, hopefully that helps you uh, tie some of the research I will talk about later in my presentation into our actual variety development program. So, you know, like any good breeding program starts with a cross. And that cross basically goes through this thing that we call a variety development pipeline. In any given year, we make about 180 or so crosses. Uh, last year, we made a lot fewer crosses because of, of COVID and the, the social distancing requirements that we had here on campus. And so we made maybe only 30 crosses last year because we're really short on labor. But we make those crosses, uh, and then those crosses basically turn into breeding populations, which turn into breeding lines, and they're funneled through the breeding program. And so I know that this, is, this uh, audience is not full of plant breeders, and so I'll, I'll simplify this as much as I can. In a breeding program, basically what we have is we start off with a lot of material. Okay, we start with a lot of material and hopefully we end up with varieties at the end of the pipeline. So we start off with a lot of number of candidates and as they flow through the pipeline, we whittle things away until we have a smaller number of candidates. And while, while we whittle things away, we increase the intensity of our testing. Okay, we test at more and more locations. We apply more and more disease resistance tests and so forth. So that's at a pretty high level at a, uh, at, at a higher level of resolution here. You can see our breeding pipeline flow again from, from the crosses. Through the inbreeding phases, we use a, a winter nursery in Chile. Actually, that's my background picture here is me making crosses uh, down in Chile uh, sometimes. So I like to joke that this is me multitasking right now. I got a, I've used that joke for about a year now. I think I got a, a few days left on it. So we make these populations. And then after we make these populations, they go into about four to five uh, years of yield trials. All right, so we, we, we conduct those. And uh, they, the number of locations per year uh, increases as, we, as they go through the pipeline. And then importantly, one thing I didn't really appreciate so much until I actually took over a breeding program is the important phase of seed multiplication and purification. Alongside these yield trials, we are multiplying seeds. And then at some point down here, we have to start purifying varieties. All right. And so this takes quite a bit of effort. So we want to make sure that things that get into this phase of our program actually uh, are worth something before we go through this effort of, of purification, uh, increasing pure seeds and releasing breeder seeds to uh, either our licensees or to our Minnesota Crop Improvement Association. And we have testing across the whole uh, state of Minnesota, ranging from Rosso, which I, I greatly enjoy going all the way up here, all the way to the Lake of the Woods and, and looking at our trials. Lake of the Woods is up here by a little bit further to the, to the, to the east there, uh, in Moore Road, all the way down to uh, near Lamberton, Minnesota. So I greatly enjoy traveling these sites in the fall and, and looking at plots. Our crossing block is in St. Paul, Minnesota. Our main site where we have most, most of our seed increases and plant rows and things like that is in Rosemont, Minnesota, about uh, 30 miles to the southeast of, of St. Paul. And we use molecular markers in the program, select on things for aphids, aphid resistance, SCN resistance, uh, fatty acids, and so forth, some other things too. So I <clears throat> really had to uh, restrain myself from going into some of these different variety targets and, and talk about them in any great detail just for the sake of time, but I'll just sort of list those 
out right here for you now. So of course we have the general purpose conventional varieties. Uh, we're looking at aphid resistance in the program. We have some exciting things there in terms of stacking aphid resistance. Uh, the high protein uh, tofu soy milk markets we try to target. We have some natto things in the program. We're looking at some black soybeans. Uh, so there's a, there's a multitude of things in the program. So we're, we're spread pretty thin, I think, across all these different market types. And so, um, you know, to be honest with you, if I were uh, a private organization, I probably wouldn't spread our targets so thinly. But since we're a public organization, I feel like we have a little bit, we can tolerate a little bit more risk um, than a private organization. And so then if, if and it's hard to predict exactly what's going to happen in the future. So if in, the, in the future, one of these market classes really takes off, we'll have some genetics in a program to work with somebody on, on developing those further. So we're, we're sort of taking a, a broad stroke at this whole thing. And on top of that, this broad, these broad, um, broad palette of different market types here lead to a lot of different research projects uh, that we can work on with students and postdocs and things like that. Okay, so a little bit about breeding methods here. So our rationale behind studying uh, breeding methods is basically to try to make the breeding process in soybeans, but maybe even all pure line crops uh, more efficient and more effective. And we do that to try to improve our own program, of course, and help our uh, collaborators improve those their, our, their programs if we find something. And then we can publish our results and, and make these uh, newly discovered methods or small, small gains and efficiencies and methods uh, known to everyone. So. You know, like a lot of programs these days, our breeding methodology research is really focused on, on, on two areas at, at the moment. That would be genomic selection and high throughput phenotyping. And, you know, the, at the end of the day, really what these two technologies, when in, integrated into a breeding program, are trying to accomplish is they're trying to basically, if you think about a breeding program in, as a funnel, okay, and we, we cram material through this funnel, and make good selections, and hopefully we get something out the end of this funnel. By applying these technologies, we basically try to widen the funnel so that we can cram more germplasm through that funnel at the same cost than we could before and therefore increase our selection intensity. And we also, through applying uh, genomic selection, hopefully we can shorten that funnel so that we get something out of, out of the program more quickly. So uh, that's, that's sort of our goal with those two things. And like I said, a lot of programs are looking at these technologies uh, for improving, their, improving uh, themselves these days. So what I want to talk about uh, right now is some of our efforts on, on using high throughput phenotyping in our program and how we're practically using that to increase the efficiency of our program. The two things we've, been start, we've started with in our program, the two traits we've, we've started with are uh, maturity dating and iron deficiency chlorosis ratings. And one of the reasons why we started with these two traits in terms of applying high throughput phenotyping uh, technologies is because we just take a lot of measurements on these traits in our program. For maturity dating, you know, we take upwards of 25,000 maturity date notes uh, per year. So anything we can do to make this more efficient will have a, a, a big impact on the wear and tear of our crew uh, in the fall when they're running around the state trying to take maturity notes. So, and then iron deficiency chlorosis, uh, we've also taken a lot of ratings on these on these um, on this trait. You know, 7,400 or so uh, per year if we do it twice. And I'll talk a little bit more about the rationale behind uh, uh, applying high throughput phenotyping technologies uh, to measuring these traits in a few slides here. So another reason why uh, we decided to focus on these traits first is because I sort of viewed them as low hanging fruit. And the reason why I view them as low hanging fruit is because, well, they're highly visual. You can capture soybean maturity dates in a very highly visual manner with a simple red, green, blue camera. Same goes for IDC uh, symptoms, of course. Uh, and, you know, the images that we take are easily related to our current scales, all right? As a plant's mature, they go from green to yellow to brown. As plants go from iron chlorosis, iron uh, deficiency stressed, they go from green to, to yellow to, to, to brown again. So it's really easy to, to relate those to our current uh, rating scales as they are. And, and therefore, it gives us a faster turnaround in terms of results. We don't have to do much interpretation of what these things actually mean. And sort of related to this is, well, I guess I sort of said this already, we already score these in our program. Uh, we do this routinely. And again, we're not scratching our head trying to figure out how we're going to interpret uh, these measurements and how they may be useful in the program. We know directly how they're gonna be useful in the program. So for these reasons, we, these are our low hanging fruit. So starting with IDC, um, uh, rating IDC resistance. I'm using resistance now more than tolerance when I made this slide, resistance, IDC resistance. Uh, we do this routinely in the program. We have an IDC nursery out by um, 
Benson, Minnesota, actually near Danvers, Minnesota, if you know where that is. And we screen at this stage in our program towards the advanced field trials and regional trials uh, stage of the program. And our IDC nursery is pretty, pretty sizable. We go out there and we basically take a, a, a one to five rating. All right, one with a one being really good and a five being uh, practically dead. All right, and we have our scores here in the middle. Two is a little bit of a little bit of yellow, leaf yellowing. Three is very yellow leaves. Four is yellow leaves with uh, some necrosis, and again, five is is really really dead. So, our, so our goal is to try to come up with a new method to 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 uh, more efficiently score these using an, an image based analysis. Well, I wanted to point out at this point that. Um, because I don't have any slides on this further in the presentation. So I wanted to point out that we're not doing this because I hate being out there in the field taking those ratings. I actually, in a nice day, I actually really enjoy being out there in the field taking ratings, taking IDC ratings with my, with my crew. It's actually quite enjoyable to get out um, in there, drive out, take a trip out to Western Minnesota. Uh, but it is a lot slower. It takes, you know, the better part of a day to do this. I can't do more than one location in a day. And I'd like to start to, to do this um, more frequently throughout the whole season so I can see how these different varieties react uh, in terms of their IDC symptoms at different times of the year and in response to different weather events. And if I want to do this say, on a weekly basis, uh, going out there and taking these ratings would just uh, be too time consuming. It, it, it would practically consume most of my summer. So, so I want to do it more often at, at more places that really at the end of the day is what I want to do with this, with this new method. So like a lot of people, uh, the, the uh, hammer we're taking to this problem is a drone. So we, we have drones in the program. We put on nice uh, little sensors here. In this case, we have a Centera double, K, double 4K sensor that has an RBG, uh, RGB bands on here, as well as an NIR. And we uh, fly those through the field. And a lot of this work was initiated in my program by a former student of mine, Austin Davos, who now works at Syngenta. In terms of the pipeline that Austin developed, that, he's, that he used to collect the data that I'm going to present. He, he developed an automatic flight plan flew the, with a, a PIX4D capture software. He uh, basically captured images in the whole field. He, he used uh, PIX4D to create what's called an ortho mosaic, basically st st stitching all those images together into a, single, into a single image. And then he masked the plants from the soil. And then he, um, he, he classified basically the different pixels in terms of whether or not they're yellow, green, or brown and extracted the information related back to the field map, uh, created a, what's called a shape file to extract the, basically the, the, the pixel composition from every single short row in that field. And then we, we you know, basically trained the data with some existing data that was taken, sorry, taken from that field uh, with a random forest classification model and uh, validated that model. So I glossed over a lot of details here. In, in a way, uh, if you if you if you follow a lot of plant breeding presentations and papers these days, this this whole process here is, has become fairly routine. So, so that, you know, at, after that's all done, this is kind of what it looks like. These are our images of some hill plots we had at, a, at another location, and we do all the imaging and the stitching and so forth. And this is basically what this looks like in, in digital format. <clears throat> so we relate all this pixel information to our actual scores to get a, a computational rating, image based rating. So these are, these are the results. I'm cutting through a lot of details here. I'm just gonna cut right to the results here. So overall, in this one particular study that we looked at, we found an accuracy on average of 77%. So what does accuracy in this case mean? Well, this here, what you're looking at is called the confusion matrix, where in the rows here, we have what our image analysis pipeline predicted in terms of the IDC score, what it classified in terms of the image analysis, and what the actual reference data would be the ground data. What did the actual a person on the ground, I think in this case it was me, uh, give that me or my technician or Austin, I guess I can't remember, give that actual plot. So you can compare those two things. So if you're on the diagonal here, it means that the, the, the drone estimate, the UAS estimate, and the ground note agreed with one another. You can see that for the, the, the one classifications, that occurred 85% of the time. For threes, it occurs 74% of the time. So 74% of the time when, when the, the person on the ground called it a three rating, the drone also called it a three. However, you'll notice that there are some errors here as well. So they're, they're not very frequent, but they are there. You'll notice that, you know, in this case, we had a, uh, a drone estimate of a four, but the human only gave it a two. And here uh, we have a drone estimate of a two, 
but the 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 human gave it a four. Okay, so these are you know they're they're not that frequent, but they're pretty consequential. I mean, it's basically this would mean the difference between me sort of letting that variety slide through the pipeline versus me kicking that out of the pipeline. Okay, and this is a if you get a four or a five in my disease nursery, uh, you're pretty much you're pretty much done for. Okay, so that's the difference of incorrectly or correctly uh, discarding the line. All right, so what about those errors? So the nice thing about all this is that we can actually go back in the images and see, okay, well, who made the mistake? Was it the drone that made the mistake or was it the human that made the mistake? And so we, we actually did that pretty systematically in this case. And so let's see what happened here in a few cases. So here we have a plot uh, from the image. Looks nice and big and green, right? So let's see what happened. Well, uh, the ground score, whoever's on the ground, gave it a four. So they gave it a pretty poor rating, whereas the drone correctly classified this as a one. This plot right here looks pretty poor. The uh, drone gave it a four. The ground note was actually a one. This plot here looks fairly healthy. The drone gave it a one. The ground note was a three. On this image, I'd probably give this a one. So, so it seems like when we looked at a lot of these cases, most of the time those errors were actually the human errors and not the drone errors. Um, so you may be thinking I'm cherry picking these results. Um, and I guess the only thing I can say against that is that we went back and looked at this more systematically by looking at the whole field altogether. And so in this trial in our disease nursery, this one year, our IDC nursery, we have 36 different trials. Okay, so we have 36, these are different, different uh, variety tests that are actually in the same, in the same field. So 36 different trials randomized in a complete block design. And in every single one of these 36 trials, we calculated the least significant difference. And we calculated for the UAS scores, drone scores and the human visual scores. And so it looks, if you look at the results across all 36 of those trials, we found that in 33 of the 36 trials, the least significant difference would be, which would be a measure of how precise or the precision of the method was lower for the UAS. All right, so you can see that in this case, and sometimes it was quite a bit lower. So it seems that we're getting uh, uh, better precision out of the UAS measurements when you look at the, those statistics within a trial. So at the end of the day, what we feel like we can conclude from this is that the drone system was faster and it seems like it's more precise. So that's the story with IDC. Let's switch over to uh, soybean maturity dating. So this is a big uh, fish for us because like I said, uh, going around the states and taking notes in 25,000 plots is uh, not a trivial matter. And uh, we're pretty much worn out by the end of this before we start count mining. So what we're doing in this case is we are basically adapting a method that was published by, by this group from Corteva, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute here. Basically, this method uses a segmented regression to relate the greenness of the canopy to the maturity date. All right, so you can see as a canopy, as a soybean canopy uh, moves through to, towards maturity, we have green canopy uh, towards yellow all the way uh, to brown. So the greenness basically uh, uh, decreases. And so if you plot out, an index that captures that greenness. In this case, they used a, uh, basically a, a greenness index. You can see that the pre senescence you have uh, is basically a flat line here. Okay, we're staying green. And then when the, the plots start to senesce or the soybeans start to senesce, we have a decay in the greenness. All right. And then at some point when it reaches this threshold, this is when the model declares the plot is being mature. So it passes the threshold. This is the date of maturity. And then you have the post senescent states. All right. So you fit basically a segmented regression model to capture this, this pattern. So this, like I said, this, this, this has been published in this, this uh, is sort of buried in this proceedings of spy journal. I'm not sure why it was there, but uh, it was there and it's a nice little paper. So what we wanted to do in our study was to basically build on the methods uh, from these authors. And we wanted to build on these methods and use them in our own program and answer some specific questions we had by determining the, determining the effect of various data collection and analysis factors. We wanted to look at what did the choice of statistical model have on the results? Uh, how about what, what kind of summary did you use to classify the pixels in any region of interest? How many, how many times you need to fly per week? So a lot of little details that we felt like we needed to, 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 to get a handle on before we actually implemented this in our breeding program. And then another thing we wanted to look at is we actually wanted to look at, okay, what are the field plot issues uh, that could lead to errors in the UAS image dating, all right? What things should we, when we talk about just overall field plot technique, how can we maximize the accuracy of this method? 
And then, you know, in addition to these, these two things, we wanted to just make a detailed description, excuse me, of our methods available and the analysis pipeline available and make the R scripts that we use to actually do this analysis publicly available. Okay, so these were things that we thought we could do to, to build on this one study so that these methods could be more uh, widely adopted in the community. <clears throat> so we had a similar pipeline uh, as, as we had before, all right, where we have um, basically a pre-designed UAS campaign, uh, images, and or create an ortho mosaic, segment out the plots, and then we look at different flights uh, uh, across the time of maturity. And then we, we uh, basically calculated some different vegetation indices. Uh, we looked at the decay of those vegetation indices through time and extracted out uh, the pixels in different sorts of ways and related these values to the, the maturity dates and to the overall greenness. Okay, so this is sort of summary of all the, the things that we did in this, in this pipeline. And I don't have a picture of them here, but I wanted to give a, an, an acknowledgement to Leo Vopada, um, who was a visiting student with me who actually did all this work uh, in, the, in a very short amount of time. He worked very hard in this study when he was here. Vision student from Vizosa, now a postdoc at Michigan State. All right, so what about, I'm not gonna answer all those questions for the sake of time, but I just wanna touch on a couple of things. One thing we're interested in is how many flights per week do we need to take for some good accuracy? And we found at these different locations that this is basically two flights per week. This is one flight per week, so two flights per week. I'm sorry, this is, this is one flight every other week one flight every other week so bi-weekly flights one flight per week two flights per week and this is all flights per week which is about three flights per week for any given location so you can see that our results here uh, pretty much indicate that uh, we plateau at one flight per week and so we feel like based on these results we can get away with one flight per week if we if we need to um, and we can't get to a field in a certain amount of time we also looked at two different models we looked at the segmented regression approach and we looked at a localized, a localized uh, smoothing regression approach here, the Loess model, and we found that they performed pretty, pretty similarly to, to one another. In this case, segmented regression worked better, but for the most part, there wasn't a, wasn't a huge difference. <clears throat> so after all that, after we um, uh, looked at all the variables that we looked at and, and picked out the best model uh, and, and the best, best techniques, we plotted out what we uh, predicted from our from our UAS to what we took on the ground. You can see that the relationship between these two measures is is pretty good. All right, so we have R squares of around up, upper 0.8, close to 0.9 in a lot of cases. In Rosemont, the R squared was actually a little bit lower. What I'll tell you right now, though, is that most of this lack of correspondence between these two methods was um, actually more air in the, the ground ratings than the UAS ratings, to be honest with you. So we had pretty good results. We had deviations here. Most of the time, we were within, we were within two days. Um, sometimes we were up to around four days off. But in terms of precision, so if we, if we use a metric of heritability here, uh, a broad sense heritability, basically that nature versus nurture metric, uh, to kind of uh, uh, quantify our precision, you'll, found, you'll find that uh, our, our, our UAS measurements are actually a bit more precise than the human, human measurements. So over here is our heritability for the UAS. Over here is the heritability of the ground measurements. And so if you're on this side of the diagonal over here, then, then, then basically the, the UAS had a better heritability than the, than the ground measurements. And so most of these points are on the upper side of the diagonal. And if you average all these different heritabilities across all these different trials at all these different locations across these two years, you will find that the, the UAS heritability was just a, a tad bit better. So they're pretty much on par with one another. So once again, you know, just like the IDC situation, what about those outliers? What about those cases where we had pretty, we had significant deviations between the human ground date versus the UAS date? And so if you looked at all the, oh, I forget, there's thousands of different plots in this study. If we looked at all those thousands of different plots, I think it was two or 3,000 plots, almost oh, more than that. Many, many thousands of plots in this study. 5% uh, of those is what we classified as outliers. So 5% of those, we had a significant deviation between the UAS-based date and the human date. So we looked, we looked, again, we went back to those 5%, and we looked at them one by one, and then we, after the fact, classified them as either a human error or a drone error. And in this case, we found that it was about half and half. About half of the time, we could attribute the outlier cause to the, the ground note, and half the time to the UAS or drone note. And if we take these uh, drone 
errors again, and we, we relate them to image to, to aspects in the field, we find that most of the time we have a, an issue or a deviation here caused by you know, heterogeneity within the variety, either because of seed contamination or maybe genetic heterogeneity from a variety that's still segregating. We had lodging issues can cause deviations. And you obvious thing you, you might know about is you know, uh, weeds, of course, if you have weeds in the plot, you're gonna have a deviation. Those weeds are green in the fall, soybeans aren't, you're gonna have a problem with that. A human can differentiate those things. An image, not so much. Um, at least an image uh, classification the way we did it. And then low germination also had an impact on that. So these are the issues that in our field that, that could cause problems, deviations between our human and, and, uh, and, and, and UAS notes, scores, dates. So what about genomic selection? I mentioned genomic selection a little bit in terms of short, shortening this pipeline. Also genotyping is cheaper than the phenotyping. We can also widen this, this funnel here to get more germplasm through and increase our selection intensity. Um, you know, really quickly, genomic selection in a nutshell is basically combining uh, whole genome DNA data, with phenotype data, uh, calibrating a fancy statistical model to relate the genotype and the phenotype information together, and using this, this statistical model to predict individuals for their performance for a complex trait um, that have been genotyped but not phenotyped. And then we make selections based on those predictions. So it's become more popular because the cost of genotyping has really plummeted in the last uh, number of years, and uh, statistical modeling has, has uh, uh, been improved so that it can better capture this high density marker data. So the important thing here is we're not actually mapping QTL, we're using all the markers for our genomic predictions. All right, so if you look, you know, not, this isn't necessarily a new, this isn't a new thing. Um, you know, there have been publications on genomic selection and plant breeding for well over 10 years now, going back to about 2000 and like uh, 2008 or so. So you can see the number of pubs increase gradually over time. So there's been a lot learned on how to apply genomic selection in the plant breeding program throughout this time. I think people have learned things like, you know, what's the exact strategy we should use to incorporate genomic selection into our, into our program? What kind of statistical model should we use? How should we allocate resources in a program to best take advantage of this technology? How many markers should we use and so forth? So this, this has all been done. These have all been done on the basis of cross-validation studies and really with the goal of, of uh, creating the publication. So in terms of going forward though, there's been, at least in the public sector, uh, relatively left progress in terms of actually incorporating this technology into an actual breeding program. And by incorporating, I mean, I just don't mean, you know, a graduate student does a project and does some selections and writes a paper or you do a couple of one-offs here and there. I'm talking about completely uh, uh, overturning your program and reorganizing your program around this technology. This has been done to a less extent compared to all these publications. So moving towards applications, some of the things that we're thinking about in our program, actually getting this going is, is helping to, 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 we're thinking about how to redesign the program. So this is what the program looks like right now, typically. You know, we typically don't make parent selections until down here. In, the, in our program, we'd like to do that something that looks more like this, where we're making selections based on genomic prediction much, much early, earlier. We'd like to make more mating decisions based on this technique called genomic mating, which is just another version of genomic selection, except uh, helping you to choose parents that complement each other best. Uh, we'd like to do more, uh, you know, weighting of our breeding populations through the pipeline using genomic prediction. We'd like to do more advancements based on genomic predictions, maybe even some some seed purification exercises as well. So we'd like to, to think about how we can shorten this pipeline up and make it more uh, efficient. So if you do a really uh, you know, crude back of the envelope uh, calculation on this, this is back of the envelope calculation, just me you know, poking around one day. I figured that if I designed my program like this, I could maybe save uh, four years in parent selection, save two years in a variety release, uh, maybe over $75,000 in plot costs, and you know, if we had genomic prediction models for all traits in, in the program, we could make uh, selections in the early stages on things that we only make selections on the later stages. You know, for example, things like perhaps SDS or white mold, something we don't typically look at until a variety has made it most of the way through the pipeline. But there are many challenges with this, and these challenges are really especially severe in the public sector. So one of those challenges would be the cost of genotyping. As much as we talk about the cost of genotyping plummeting and plummeting and going and down, the fact of the matter is, is that it's really 
it's really uh, quite <laughs> expensive yet. We want to do tens of thousands of, of individuals per year. So, you know, if you're talking about genotyping typing costs of say uh, 10 bucks or so per sample, you want to do 10,000 progeny rows in a year, that's a hundred thousand dollar investment in, in genotyping. And that's, that's a, that's a lot to bite off for a public breeding program. Turnaround time, we have to make decisions pretty quickly. And unless we have systems in place, software systems in place to quickly turn those predictions around, we won't be able to make selections quickly enough uh, to, to make our advancements to winter nursery or perhaps spring planting. So things have to be really streamlined to do this really, really well. And again, uh, a, a private organization that has a whole department of statisticians and quantitative geneticists to work on that full time is an entirely different scenario than a public program that that may not have those resources and may maybe rely mostly on postdocs and grad students to do that work. You know, again, and then related to that, human resources. You know, the people who who tend to have the interest in doing this work and and the 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 um, the classwork and educational background to do this work are going to be those students and, and postdocs who are oftentimes temporary. So once you teach them everything you know how to do that, then they go and take their skills elsewhere and work for somebody else. Oftentimes, so that's a challenge. And this is all this is all a big risk. There's something. There's something uh, uh, just, you know, I don't know how to, how to say it exactly, but it's, it's, um, it's not quite comforting to know that you're making all these selections and investing all, in all these predictions and not be able to see, see your results with your own eyes until, until later on, where you may have already spent a lot of resources and perhaps you got nowhere. So there's a, there's a risk there and um, that can prevent people as well. So just Clayton, uh, I want to acknowledge a student of mine, Clayton Wartha, and a postdoc who just moved on recently, Sushan Ru, for doing a lot of this work for me these last few years. All right, so in terms of uh, trying to address some of these topics, I'm part of a, uh, a project that's funded by the North Central Soybean Research Program that's called SoyGen, and it's led up by Leah McHale at Ohio State University. And so what we're doing with David Hyten, or David Hyten is basically doing this at the University of Nebraska, is he's coming up with new uh, genotyping techniques to really drive that cost of genotyping down to that range of 3 to $5 and increasing that efficiency. That's really where we need to be to really make this a reality in the public program. We are um, better capturing data and putting those into actual uh, organized and uh, databases than we had been before. So all this data we collect in our cooperative regional trials has now been uh, put into a, a, a database that we can query and easily pull down analyzable data instead of it existing in, in PDFs and hard copies and things like that. So we're doing that. We're also genotyping many lines and public programs, including all those that go to regional trials. And we're developing better workflows, um, especially importantly on the, the genome-wide genotype management side of things. So how do we manage genome-wide, how do we manage genome-wide genotype data in an organized way, not just a bunch of flat files scattered around a bunch of folders, but in a very organized way, and then connect that to a very streamlined uh, workflow so that we can quickly make optimal predictions and get uh, selection decisions made in time. So these are, you know. Um, this, this, this isn't really a lot of, there's not a, not a lot of questions driving these types of resource developments, but I feel like we need to develop these resources to make this a reality in the public program. Okay. Um, in terms of new trace and germplasm, I want to touch on IDC a little bit. Uh, Dr. Goose just gave a great talk on IDC, and so I want to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing on genetics related to that. So these are two lines that differ for an IDC, a QTL that affects IDC resistance. And real quickly, we've done some association mapping on IDC and our, everybody has their favorite QTL for IDC. Our favorite Q, QTL for IDC resistance at the University of Minnesota is this one of chromosome five. All right, we found this in association mapping using a diverse panel of accessions. We found this in elite germplasm as well. Okay. It actually is the only one that really came up with much importance in this, in this association mapping study on chromosome five. My predecessor, Jim Orff and a student uh, did some QTL mapping, some biparental QTL mapping using FISC to my Mandarin in Ottawa, and also found this chromosome 5 QTL. And uh, since then, a collaborator of mine, Bob Stupar, myself, and uh, student Ryan and Mary have fine mapped this QTL using heterogeneous inbred families. All right, so we did a series, uh, series of fine mapping based on this. We basically fine mapped this this um, chromosome 5 QTL down to a pretty small region on the very end of chromosome 5. And there are 17 gene models within this current region that we have. We're further fine mapping this thing down. And we do have a couple of very, uh, we have well, not a couple, we have one 
uh, favorite candidate gene that we're actually doing uh, gene expression studies on, uh, gene editing studies on, and we're um, hopeful that this is the actual causal causative gene underlying this QTL. And if we can confirm that in the next number of years here with MJ, I cut off MJ here. Where's MJ? <laughs> oh, my computer is slow. Well, anyway, MJ was back there. MJ's PhD study is basically to try to confirm that QTL using the technologies I just talked about. So if, if we can do that, that would be the first uh, confirmed uh, gene underlying IDC resistance in, in soybean. So we've, we've back crossed this QTL into some elite varieties. You can see that it has a pretty good effect on IDC resistance, you know, not complete resistance, but a 20% improvement. And in our, our scale, that is about a, a one point increase. So that's, those are the, um, that's, that's what I have to present to you today. Uh, just to summarize here, I just want to point out that, you know, we are a program that strives to fully integrate cultivar development research and education all together. I feel like that's what that's what uh, we strive, that's what we strive to do. And, and we feel like we're good at that. And uh, so that's the direction we're going. And then I talked a bit about uh, um, integrating genomic and hydrogen phenotyping technologies into our public breeding program, and not just using them, but seamlessly using them in the program, making them as routine as doing crosses and taking field notes. Uh, but it's hard, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to do this, but I think we're gonna continue to try to do this um, because it will bring about efficiencies and even more importantly i feel like it's good uh, to educate future scientists graduate students and postdocs in that context of using these technologies to improve a breeding program and i'll just point out here that i, I greatly look forward to to uh, continuing and expanding collaborations with uh, Kerry and ndsu to to benefit the growers of the whole region there's no reason why we can't work together to benefit farmers across the whole the whole north central region so I look forward to, to more of those collaborations. So with that, I have a huge team here to thank. I'm really appreciative of everybody who works in my program. My technician, Sonia. Uh, CD is uh, an assistant breeder right now. Uh, Raphael, Jen, Art, and, and Leo make the program hum and they're really wonderful people to work with. I had the opportunity to work with some really great graduate students. I have some really fantastic sources of funding here, especially from the checkoff funding, which we really appreciate. And um, with that, I'll just be quiet. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. That was a really excellent presentation. You have a gigantic team. I, they're, and they're a great team. They're wonderful people to work with. Yeah. Wow, wow, that's impressive. You know, uh, Leah McHale just emailed me yesterday to join SoyGen. Oh, good, I, yeah, good. Yeah, um, so uh, it's really exciting to, actually, as soon as you came on and you started talking about the drone technology, I texted my technicians to say, you're on right now, right? Because you should be watching this because this is what we're doing next. Um, so I do have some questions, um, just a few, because we need to still do some other stuff before we hear the keynote. Um, so I know this is probably a dated question, um, but when drone technology was first introduced to, to take maturity notes, and in this case, IDC, you know, one of the biggest hurdles to overcome was color differences based on um, sun availability. Like for example, if you take notes on a cloudy day that your uh, your results wouldn't be consistent as if you took those uh, results on a sunny day, especially because sun can affect the way color uh, colors are perceived by a camera. So has that been overcome or either in like a technological or just a, how you choose what time <laughs> you take your photos? Well, yeah, we're we're really careful to make sure we take our do our flights all between um, ten and two o'clock. So you want to be around that window of solar noon to take your 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 flights. And um, I mean, you can depends what you're using the the uh, images for. So if you want to carefully calibrate between imaging dates, you can definitely put uh, calibration panels out there. So they're basically panels that have different shades of gray on them. And you can use them to calibrate your your images, um, so you, you can do that. But for a lot of stuff, we do like the maturity dating and the um, the uh, IDC stuff. We're really just making comparisons within that one date of flight. And so as long as we're flying without lots of scattered overhead clouds, and we have you know clouds covering the sun one second and complete sunshine the other second, 
doesn't really matter so much because they're pretty much all illuminated. The flights don't take that long. And so they're pretty much all illuminated to the same degree. And then another thing about these traits that I talked about right here is the, the vast differences, especially in maturity at least, the, the, the extreme color differences kind of uh, swamp out any subtle differences in, in sunlight illumination. Okay, that's interesting. Um, I have so many questions actually, uh, but I'll keep it to major ones. They're <laughs> probably the audience you're most interested in. How long does it take you now to analyze your data? You, you know, you're talking about data turnaround time being a bottleneck, which completely makes sense. Um, so, you know, you go out, you take your flight once a week. Can you analyze that data before your next flight or is it just something you wait until the end of the season to do? Uh, we typically wait till the end of the season. Yeah, yeah. Um, because we don't use the, the IDC scores, we don't use those until the end of the season uh, until we're making selections. Uh, and then the, the maturity dating would be the tougher one because we take all those images in September and then we have to have those turned around pretty quickly for reports that start to be due in November. So that's right. That, that can be <laughs> that's <kind of> right. <laughs> Seriously, as soon as you get the, the harvest data, you're like, oh, I got to start writing my reports. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So have you so have you tried any IDC markers yet? You know, we were talking earlier about some markers that were developed by Phil McLean. I think that Iowa State also developed some. And I think private, I can't remember from that Corteva panel, there's some IDC ones too. So have you tried using anything like that and have they been successful? No, not not we we just worked with that one on chromosome five just for that back crossing project. But that's that was more to to create genetic resources for studying this QTL more, not necessarily for selections in the breeding program. We've done a little bit of that, but, um, you know, I guess, like I said, even, even that one chromosome five, when you put it, when you put them into isogenic and isogenic background or, or create each near isogenic lines. So everything is kind of the same across the whole genetic background. We see about a half a point to a point effect on that one QTL. And that's one of the, and, that, and that's one of the bigger ones out there. So the question is the, one, one marker doesn't make a big effect. So yeah. um, for markers, you know, we'd have to use several markers at one time or maybe some sort of genome-wide prediction approach if we wanted to, if we wanted to do that. Yeah. Great. Well, I really look forward to adopting a lot of these technologies that you've been working on um, for a while in, into the NDSU program. I think that there's a lot of, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity. And as I've spoken to you before, but we haven't, you know, said publicly, but you probably saw my, in my presentation, how can we turn some of these phenotype tools into an accurate measurement for yield? Um, I think I think that would be, you know, the maturity notes and the IDC notes are extremely helpful too, because you're right, it's a lot of man hours to do that manually. Um, but it would be interesting if we could use those tools to have more accurate yield prediction. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, I don't know, <laughs> we, we can see. It, Canopy coverage and things like that, NDVI and mid-season uh, could be some some candidates perhaps, but what's their what's their correlation to yields? Probably pretty small. Um, and you plan the trial anyway, so there's questions about whether you, what what's what's the extra cost about and actually cow mine a trial. So it, it's it's yeah. a tough question. So yeah, it's true, but we'll figure it out. Don't worry, we'll get the excellent yield predictor model for everybody, and it'll. Again, saving all the public programs, making us more profitable than Bayer and Corteva.